and I'll start recording this with the group working group or the risk working group meeting, the group working group meeting as well uh, for June 10th, 2021. Um, you can put your name under the June 10th attendees, which I will show you. Um, there we go. You should see that screen share now. Um, the next, does anyone else have any other, what I was thinking we could start doing is actually working on the metrics for risk. Hello, everyone. Hello, David Wheeler. How are you doing? We're doing well. How are you doing? I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Why, Dave? Why, David? There's Why not, there's, I mean, there's nothing to do. I mean, yes, there, uh, there are many tasks, and I want to do well on all of them, but I have to split my time. So I end up <laughs> going, oh, my gosh. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, we had a fun launch this week that's sort of related. Yeah. I was thinking I about putting it in Slack, but I don't know if you other, others have seen it. I've heard of it, but I don't honestly uh, know with certainty what it is like i know it's, it's google's an, dependency tools it's an <laughs> aggregate dependency mapper so instead of looking at any of the ones that are focused on specific package managers it goes it combines them and it combines mm -hmm. them with vulnerability reporting so i've known about it for a while but i couldn't talk about it until now yeah. uh, <laughs> when we were like maybe like two months ago we were talking about available tools that oh are yeah available i do um, i do i do, I do remember that I do remember that yeah. because we so, have the, this list, but now there's another one that now there's is another one, which is important. And what is it called? We put it the link in the chat. It's called um, Google. It's called Open Source Insights. Um, it's depths.dev. Um, Can you put that in the notes? Yes. Well, I was thinking of the uh, Chaos Working Group notes, but I mean. That works oh, yeah. too. I, uh, I, um, yes. Sophia, I, I, I have a couple questions on on that one um, on on depth dev. Um, mm -hmm. That I, as soon as I saw it, I dropped it in the link to uh, drop the link in our team chat because we, you know, are so deep in some of this analysis as well, and it covers some of the uh, some of the ground mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Libraries IO covered, but different ground and some of the ground that some other tools cover in different ground. One of the first questions was about an API and wondering where that might be on the roadmap. Um, I can ask. Okay. Um, and it was it was interesting to me to see it launch with sort of limited package support, given there's a number of tools out there that have have already sort of covered the ground of unpacking these package manifests and sort of drilling into it. So. Um, is there anything you can you can say to that, or any insight you can give us there? Not that's that helpful. Um, when I <laughs> I've interacted with that team, I I wasn't a part of this project. I met with them a few times just to get a sense of what they were building. Um, what they ended up building wasn't even the same thing that I saw four months ago. Um, I think they were kind of just playing around with what what the white space was. I know they've been working on it for a long time, um, so. I know they're trying to get as much in there as possible. So there were some that were just easier to, to hook in and others that were not. Um, but in terms of the, the level of comprehensiveness and what was left out and why I'm not, I'm, I can ask if there are specific things on the roadmap. I don't know what's, I don't know what's in flight. The API is my only specific question. And no, I, I don't want to derail yeah. it. Well, I'll stop asking questions, but thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I had a yeah. quick question. Actually, I, I was just wondering what the response has been. If For this? Know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's been, we had some positivity in the sense that there was a lot of consensus that dependency mapping is hard um, and being able to enumerate uh, the extended list of dependency trees and transitive dependencies. Um, and so there was positivity in response to trying to make that more accessible um, or just 
calling into question the importance of it and mechanisms to do it, even if this isn't necessarily a tool to do it with. Um, so in that sense, there, are, there was a positive reaction. Um, I'm also not on the PR team. I'm assuming they, they know more than I do. <laughs> uh, but I do know this was a, a fairly long time coming. They've been building this thing for a few years. Um, so this was, I'm guessing that they have more to come. Um, I still don't quite know what the scary little creature mascot means, but I did want to ask that as well because I'm just curious. Is there a mascot? Yeah. If you scroll down, it's this like little creepy eyeball oh. fuzzy guy. Oh. That looks like a dependency tree, actually. <laughs> that, that absolutely looks like a dependency tree. It looks like Halloween. Uh, oh, dependency I, tree. Yeah. Um, but I, I will ask about APIs because I, I think that that's relevant to trying to understand the extensibility of what they built. Um, but just ping me if you if you have other questions, and I can I can see what what we're allowed to talk about at this stage. I mean, I'm assuming now it's a public project, so they should be more forthcoming with information. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail your topic. No, chart. it's. <laughs> I was going to ask you about it, so it's not. It's our agenda. All right. So, um, <clears throat> let us know. I. So that's exciting. Um, is it written in Go? I assume. I think so. I don't know. Uh, that would be my guess, but a lot of things are written in Go. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I don't see how to get to the GitHub repository. Weird. They might not have open sourced the code. They might have op only open sourced the tool. Uh, okay. I don't understand the distinction. It's free for public for now. Oh, the data. OK, they might have open sourced the data is what you mean. Yeah. So like you can go in and put in like I just I'm looking at the like, Kubernetes IO. Yeah. Yeah. And you okay. can see all the licenses, you can see the number of dependencies. Right. Okay. Yes, I've 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 played around with this. Okay. I mean this is exciting. It would be I would be more excited if they open source the code, but the data is pretty good. <clears throat> But yeah, that really makes Dwayne's question about an API super relevant. If you can't run it yourself, mm -hmm. you would need you would need okay. an API to access it. All right. Yeah, and what's what's amusing is uh, if you if you basically they've yanked in the uh, OpenSSF scorecard, and of course, you know, I immediately mm -hmm. notice, oh look, CI best practices is on there. <laughs> oh, is it awesome? Oh yeah. But if it's there, so you know, if you if you um, here, I'll, let me paste in the a, a link to the Kubernetes data. I think that's that's a useful sample example. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, because with Kubernetes, you know, Kubernetes, there's a lot of actual data you can get about it. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, David, there might be some overlap between the folks that work on the scorecard and the folks that were supporting this project. Oh, I think that's a certainty. Are, are, are you are you joking? <laughs> I know there. I know there's overlap. <laughs> oh yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What's the okay? Um, for example. So Kubernetes does not freeze and fail dependencies. I find that hard to believe. <clears throat> it does not freeze. I guess. Um, well, that's, that's, exactly that's what true. that tool finds. Now, whether, well, uh, well, if you click on it, it, um, it has a list. So, yeah. for example, the Docker file has non-pin dependencies on set cap image, base image. Uh, oh, it's all Docker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're all, it looks like uh, everything I, I, I mean, I'd have to read through, but it looks like it's all within the Docker image. Um, and, and you know what, I, that actually, now see, I'm not so sure the Elasticsearch isn't pinned, but the ones where there's a variable, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, by definition, it's not pinned, right? Mm -hmm. Unless right, that variable right. is it sets forced. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would have to look more, but at least the data it shows there, um, I mean, at first blush, it looks like it's correct. Yeah. You know, have to no. drill in further, but at least, how's this? It, it certainly passes the giggle test. It has actual things that l sure don't look pinned, uh, unless yeah. there's something else that pins them as an intermediate step. Yep. Signed releases is a little more surprising. Is that SAST? Oh, signed uh, releases. Signed releases. <clears throat> yeah. Now, now to be fair, uh, I, I I do know the folks who at least uh, do, who developed the scorecard thing. Um, what they what that really means is they can't find it. It may be uh, there, but mm -hmm. you know they have various heuristics to find these things, and if they can't find it, then they can't find it. Right. Well, that's exciting. I mean, it's certainly uh, another place to look. And <clears throat> there is some really interesting analysis here. Like the that's a really that. scary graph picture, if you want to. <laughs> Where? We're talking about scary graphs. Um, yeah. How they get there. Um, shoot, I found it before. There's a way to visualize this as a graph. Uh, when you're in the dependencies, if you click on scroll up, um, the top bar dependencies, you're viewing it as a table. You can also view it as a graph. It's a bit terrifying and it reminds me oh, of your wow. terrifying view. Um, but <laughs> we had initially, for those that are relatively new to this conversation, had, we're exploring different ways that you could visualize dependencies and all kind of came to the conclusion that trying to view the graph would be uncomprehensible. And this is an example of that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> I would call it terrifying. I would call it incomprehensible. <laughs> the word you second. Yeah. Uh, and, and I will say, um, now, although it's not exactly the same view, we I tried to so do the like same a... thing, the best practices badge, and we had exactly the same problem. You know, if you only have five dependencies, it's really easy. Nobody has only five dependencies anymore. It's like this for everyone. Yeah. This looks like a battle scene where the Rebel Alliance gets destroyed by the Empire. <laughs> <laughs> that was a uh, you know, I'm not sure I can recover from that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you, the, the, the obvious way to sort of recover is to only show one level. But even that is, it, you know, it, it's not so easy. Um, I mean, at that point, you really end up with just making a list, yeah, like this, a simple text list, which is okay. I mean, it works, but yeah. you don't really, at least the list gives you an inside of the scale. The, the graph yeah. is just incomprehensible. You know. I've never found anybody who really managed to solve that, if, if that's any help. No, I don't think it's solvable, actually. Or if it's solvable, it's like some kind of virtual reality. We are floating through space and time. Um, there I are folks did, who have done yeah. something like, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, no. I, I did like how they also have forward and backward uh, in terms of dependencies and dependents, um, where a lot of, I haven't really seen a lot of dependency analysis that also has that view. Um, there are folks who do this as social network graphs. Um, you know, like, you know, the, I, I, I tracked, I'm tracking a whole bunch of people, which one's the terrorist kind of thing, kind of games. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> you know, they show the graphs, but as far as I can tell, the showing the graphs is to show, wow, we have a lot of data. You know, they, the analysis is you focus on specific things and then you use code to, I, to find the patterns. You don't actually try to look at these graphs for insight. I, I just don't think people can do that. No, I don't think there's anything to digest here. There's too much to digest. But um, what does a filter look like? Filter? Yes, it <clears throat> does. on the uh, left um, side. Yeah, like this. Uh, so if I type in Jason in the filter, then I only see 
the ones that contain JSON somewhere, I would presume, or I don't know what the filter is filtering on. Some of them have JSON in the name, some of them don't. So presumably there's <clears throat> some kind of deeper filter than just the name. It's not clear what the different colors mean, I guess. Maybe one is a primary dependency, one is secondary. What's a weird decision, Dwayne? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, building an open source insight tool is not open source. Yeah. Like, let's just hope it's not open source yet. Yeah. Oh, and then, uh, okay. Um, anything else we need to probably talk about there? No. I thought today maybe we could work a little bit on um, some of our metrics and ups. So, if I'm remembering from our discussions, I think maybe there is some translation that didn't get from our minimum viable product. So we have repository dependency enumeration and we have upstream. Are we just, are we keeping separate metrics for upstream and downstream? Because I know we have them, but I, I remember a discussion where we talked about just having dependencies or upstream and downstream was a would be a filter on it, and it would just be one metric. Does anyone want to? What what do people think? Do I remember that correctly? Okay, then again. So we have uh, in our minimum viable products, minimum viable products, we have dependency enumeration. Um, range, libiers, known vulnerabilities, scorecards, et cetera. But when we, and I remember saying that, I remember a conversation about dependencies being just dependencies with upstream and downstream being filters on dependencies, but our metric spreadsheet still has upstream and downstream specified. And I don't remember if we decided to keep that or if we intended to eliminate the separation at the metrics level and just have them be um, dependencies writ large. So these are the upstream codependency metric. And this is downstream. I'll put it in the chat. That's upstream. Downstream's not developed at all. But I think when we, I mean, my thinking is maybe that it makes sense to have them be just dependencies and with upstream and downstream as filters. I feel like a term I hear is dependence. So downstream dependencies are dependence. But okay. that's just a term that I hear used. I also Should share we... on my health care signal page or something i feel like as well it's a different kind of <laughs> that seems like a different thing our fun i well, feel like yeah it's complex i feel like i would keep them separate because yeah. of the decisions you make between them mm -hmm. so if like if you're just thinking about dependencies then it's monitoring things that will impact you if you're mm -hmm. thinking about dependence it's how your changes impact others so I think that it's a different kind of risk communication and choice um, in terms of how you would use that information. So I feel like it's that warrants it to be separate. When you say separate, you mean upstream and downstream or dependencies and dependence because I've- De uh, Yeah, dependencies and dependence. I, I, I like that language as well, Arfan, not that it, it also aligns with the page we were just looking at. So I don't actually know how consistent that is across other things. So we at least know there's one other. <laughs> um, but I, I, can, I certainly understand. Yeah. I understand, like, is so dependencies replaces upstream and dependence replaces downstream. 
or can you have upstream dependence and dependencies? Because it feels like dependence and dependencies are opposite sides of the same of the same flow, or opposite streams of the same flow, and it feels like dependence and dependencies are the same upstream and downstream. Are, so I'm a little confused. Yeah. So dependence are downstream hmm. dependencies. So projects okay. on you. That's all. That's all right. A, I think. Yeah. I just I just feel it as directional. Like, yeah. If you're in the middle of the things that you're using, and then the things that are using you, you. so like everything has directional. I mean, it's basically it's flowing down a river so upstream is stuff that's coming into you downstream is things that are that you're sending your what you've done out to so should we call them dependencies and dependence or should we overload it so that everybody part of me wants to overload it include all the language so that there's no confusion but part of me thinks that's explicitly confusing then actually Maybe it's more confusing to say both. So I've got upstream code dependencies and dependencies, downstream code dependencies, which are dependents. We just want to call them dependencies and dependents. <clears throat> and get rid of the upstream downstream designation. So uh, help me again. What do you, what are you proposing? Um, to uh, text? Yeah, it's uh, it's so. I added, I, I made this downstream code dependencies with dependence in parentheses. And then I made this upstream code dependencies with dependencies in parentheses. But those, those two could be just dependence and dependencies. And we could <clears throat> be specific in the description about the inclusion of upstream downstream as the same thing. Do have... or whether or not that would be understood. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I'm struggling with is how to communicate this because it's certainly been a, a source of confusion for me from time to time. I think, go back to David's analogy of the river, I think upstream and downstream pretty well understood. Like mm -hmm. if you, if I just did a quick search um, and you see lots of people saying, what is the difference between upstream and downstream dependencies? So I guess there's some confusion. Um, yeah. So maybe how you have it, upstream codependencies, dependencies, and then downstream codependencies, dependence. Yeah, so that, 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 I like I like that one because dependencies yeah, okay. versus dependence is incredibly hard to hear. Yes. Um, I think I, I find most people if they're if they're the same in the first five characters, um, you won't notice. Yeah. In fact, the old versions of the fourth programming language, um, they you could have any ver the variables they didn't care after the first yeah. five letters, I, I first lose... five letters in length. <laughs> so yeah. upstream dependencies, downstream dependence. Okay. And then now we define we've so this is we've kind of fleshed out or started to flesh out upstream code dependencies, and I'm wondering if we could try to finish fleshing that out and then use whatever structure we create on the other one. So one thing we could do is just read this for a minute and see if see how we feel about how far it is. I, I, can you go to the top here? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let me. You know, I've it might the, be easier if I. The just... link is pasted in the chat. I yeah, I th I'm, I'm thinking instead of trying to read off Zoom, it might be useful. To oh, just... for sure. I think so. Yeah. All right. Um, let me do that. I'm just going to delete your extraneous yeah. comma. <laughs> please, please do. All, all, um, yes. Should we just start voicing feedback in real yes. time or do you want to pause? Sure, it? go for it. Um, 
I'm curious, the, so we referenced the upstream infrastructure dependencies, but I'm assuming that's a metric that will not be officially defined when this releases. Oh, yeah, I think actually we did get rid of that, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we want to get rid of it permanently, but it's not going to be released by it. So we might want to not say defined as, but say we've <laughs> like scoped that as a separate metric to be assessed at a later date or like something way to allude to it. Because I think that statement is still relevant to say that we're not looking at the, uh, the infrastructure dependencies and we consider that a separate category. about that that works this figure we, we don't have I'll anything get, to link to so i'll get rid of the link yeah i think there's just a way to okay oh i meant i saw it it's but the link will still exist somewhere when whenever we want to come back to that in case there's something in there. yeah <laughs> yeah i don't think there was i think it was a naked definition okay all right, that a template, last one, I think is the word. Yes, template. Yeah, by the way, that last one, interpretive languages, that doesn't seem like a parameter. Interpretive uh, languages. Yeah, that's not a parameter. I mean, that's a, <clears throat> that is just a oh. fact. So are we include, is the real issue, does it include the interpreter runtime environment or not? Is that what the issue is? So, I mean, Dwayne actually gave me a really good example of where this happens all the time in my Python setup files and my node setup files. It never specifies that I need node or NVM or a version of node of a particular type or version right. of Python. So it also the... doesn't specify the operating <laughs> system kernel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, although if you build a Docker container, you can. Um... <laughs> uh so, so, typically but, but to, doesn't. Chime in, to chime Sorry. in there david though it doesn't specify an operating system but it also doesn't care it just specifies there must be some kind of operating system like i'm running on something so i think there's an important distinction there is there a distinction what's the distinction um i think if no, I'm running in, Python, in, if I'm running Python code, I assume that there's a Python interpreter, but typically I don't care which one. An interpreter is actually probably the wrong phrase. A, I presume I have an implementation of Python mm -hmm. and I have an implementation of an operating system kernel. Well, I, th I think there's a, there's, a, there's a difference in the level of specificity there. And I, and I, and I, mm -hmm. I, I see your point. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm able to articulate what how i see the difference there so the, that's why i'm challenging you a little one, bit i'm not one, sure that that distinction is as clear as you want to make it so one place <laughs> one one place that it's a little bit more clear uh -huh. is i can I, let's take python and machine learning and let's talk about tensorflow whenever linux kernels upgrade then eventually the platforms like ubuntu or fedora do an upgrade Tech, generally speaking the released long-term support version of Ubuntu is at least one whole version behind in Python support because all of the machine learning libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch rely on the updates of these, these um, Fortran and other compilers, you know, Fortran compiler right. has to be updated. So there's all these dependencies on compilers that haven't been updated yet. So. I can run my software on any version of Ubuntu or Fedora, but there's sort of an implicit lag because I use machine learning in the Python upgrade. But that is also tied to the Linux platform because Ubuntu still doesn't distribute Python 3.9 on its long-term support platforms because TensorFlow and PyTorch and all those other libraries don't yet support Python 3.9. <clears throat> Although that seems to be changing in the past few weeks, I think it's very soon. Do you see my point? Like it's, it's, I can always run it on the Linux versions, but there's a Python explicit requirement that has to be in a certain range. Like for Augur right now, it's up to three, but where you support up to 3.8.x. And once Py, PyTorch and TensorFlow support 3.9, we'll support 3.9. All right. So, uh, but see, uh, uh, it's not even clear that so much interpretive language. It's really the runtime. You know, are we including yeah. the runtime? 
I, I, I guess having had a second to think about it, David, I, I would I would say that node applications that are running on something that isn't node gotta be an edge case, right? I'm I'm hey. sorry, what? A node no. application that's being run by something that isn't node, that's gotta be an edge case. Less so for so, Python. Uh, right. There are there are significant C Python's the most popular, but right. it is not certainly not the only one. Same for Ruby. There are there's a, a common most common implementation, but there are others. That's not true for uh, some other languages though. Um, you know there are languages you know, C being one for example, where you absolutely might use different compilers. Okay. Yeah, C is C is an example where if like if I can't find a distribution for the combination of different dependencies I have, oftentimes PyPy is going to pull down the source code for that library and compile it in C during my install. So things that are compiled in C do seem to they exist in that form so that you can overcome other dependencies, it seems. Is that yeah. fair? All right, so basically, I, I think for the purposes of this, I mean, the question is just, are we including the runtime, right? That's yeah. really, that, yeah. that's all we want to care about. You know, and, and in fact, we can go further. Are we including the language runtime um, mm -hmm. in in uh, in count? No, language runtime and default uh, default language libraries. Mm. And I presume normally no. <laughs> the I don't know default. What are default language libraries? Just like uh, Python has a batteries included construct, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you know, if you import of a library, mm -hmm. technically that's a dependency, right? But if you're importing RE in Python, that's right. the regular it's... expression library that's built into the. You you can't have something called Python without that library. Yeah. Are you going to include that in the count? Probably not. Well, it depends. I mean, if I had a choice or if I thought about it for 10 seconds, I think you're right. Probably not. When I do pip freeze, though, I think it doesn't tell me those library versions for the for like RE. Um, let me just see here. Let's see. All right. I want to split these out because I think these are different questions. You know, are you going to include well the Python, are you including the the language runtime probably should list that first are you including the default libraries in the count okay uh, I would say default no you know eg for example re in Python and I think normally you wouldn't because typically you are asking a package mm -hmm. manager and package managers normally don't manage that stuff because there's nothing for them to manage right yeah like i just double checked pip freeze does not include anything that is compiled with the python like re right um or sys like none of those and, and, and um, it would make sense i mean, I mean yeah, know, I it is what it, it is if you're yes. going to run on python there's a separate system for creating a virtual environment to freeze a particular version of the runtime and there... that by implication would freeze not just the runtime, but also the libraries from the language. Yeah. So if you tell it you're gonna run in Python 3.8 and you, you use VNV or something else to switch to that, or BEMV in the uh, Ruby world, um, mm -hmm. that'll switch both the runtime and the default language libraries. Yeah. So that's what makes it the default, it's the built-in. Uh, how's that? Is that clear? Yes. <clears throat> so now we, we so now yeah. you can ask that question. I'm suggesting normally you wouldn't include them, but you obviously could. Right. I'm going to call them free with the language libraries. Yeah. 
I would call them so included, but, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll only treat Frito included. Okay. But, included but with, yeah. yes, but, but, oh, I, I agree with the point. So, Dwayne, to the challenge that you and I have been have discussed before, it seems that one would hope for some standard way of knowing or being able to articulate or enumerate the dependencies that are implicit. So obviously I think Python 3.x is implicit if I'm including Python libraries in most cases, 2.x in, in some increasingly rare cases. And I don't know if anybody, is there a way that these kinds of sort of, I want the, the, the not, the not managed by package managers, the sort of, hey, you've got to have this stuff, stuff that's usually in a readme. Is there any standard way of, of making a note of that? Sure. That uh, those, are, that's, those are called virtual environments. Oh, I will well, point yes. you to this uh, in, in Python. I will give you a link in there. Uh, okay. Typically controlled, uh, well, I, typically, often controlled by virtual environments. I mean, I have virtual environments that I use with Python, but I don't ship any of them. Everybody builds it on their own. Is like well, but the Python selection of them, the selection of it though is absolutely controlled. Uh, E.g., uh, venv in Python. Okay, uh, then there's tools like rbenv, and there's there's two of them in in uh, the Ruby. Ruby, world. of course there are. There's eleven in the R world. Actually, one, uh, yeah. One, one nice thing in Ruby in the gem files these days, you can specify the language runtime as well. So that's actually pretty uh, yes, you can. Um, yes, that's right. So uh, R B E N V in Ruby. Yeah, in Ruby. So to, to, but to, to follow up, I am not currently aware, even these things aside, um, Sean, I think I'm answering your question here, mm -hmm. of a standard way that this information is included as part of a project, right? Like there's not... Right. A, a correlating manifest that is typically shipped in a project that you can inspect and get at this information. You can get at it on an environment by environment basis, um, but like not that I've encountered. And and Sophia, this is sort of related to the conversation. Oh, that's it, that's yeah. It, this, that that is a language specific question. Right. Uh, I you know so for example in Ruby it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, you're supposed to put that in .ruby version, mm -hmm. and a file, and then you're done. Uh, right. Typically, that's referenced from the file called gem file, which is your list. It's the unlocked list of libraries, or gem file .lock, which is the locked list. Right. And then you're done. Uh, so there. So within the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, there's a standard uh, convention for it. You're absolutely right, though, that in other systems, there's absolutely no standard way to record that information. Right. And and it kind of makes sense that it would be language specific. Uh, I think we could make a very good case that languages which don't have such a system should ha start uh, should switch and start having one. <laughs> exactly. And 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 this is this is sort of the like I don't think it's that different from package manifests that are all language specific anyway, but the conventions have converged across language ecosystems that you include them in the repo, right? Um, one of the things that we did to get at some of this information for the purposes of Mariner and doing our own analysis is, is for the Python project, we have uh, you know a, a script that you can run in the environment that just exports um, some of those standard variables and then like a custom little bit of code to consume them. But in, in terms of trying to figure out how to stack the importance of those against the importance of package level dependencies that are included all over the place, it's very much a, a, an apples and oranges thing. Like these are, right. this applies everywhere that Python is used. How important is that to you? Well, pretty freaking important, obviously. Um, yeah, Python is actually in many ways one of the worst. Um, 
I mean, well, and recently C and C plus plus are probably the worst, and then it's Python's the worst. Python, and then and, you have other systems. Yeah. Well, and Py PyPy actually has started to increase the logic for its refusal to compile incompatible libraries or dependencies. It used to just compile it straight up with no questions. And over the last six months to a year, and especially in the last six weeks, five, four to six weeks, I've seen my PyPy build failures increase dramatically. So they're starting to break more and more stuff um, if you have incompatible libraries in your build. Right. Um, which is nice. It's a helpful it, well, it's gonna, actually, it's, it's awful short term. It's going to yeah. be good long term right. if you can survive that long. It's uh, pretty easy to like as long as you've done some level of. Con if you've never managed that on your project, then it's going to be a big hurdle. But right. if you've mostly managed it like we have, then it's just a few small things that peak up. It's nice to get notified when something changes. Um, the, the solution is lock files then you know what everyone, mm -hmm. then you at least have one set that no, is known to work and yep. then repeat. Um, and that's what I we do with setup.py. I'm sorry? We just, we, with setup.py, we just lock down the explicit version of every library. Right, right. And but the, the question is, does your system, it, it, can you actually believe it? <laughs> um, right. Uh, sometimes I wonder, honestly. It's like, and I have no way to like dig deep and check that, but sometimes I do wonder. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was going to tap Sophie on the on, on the shoulder there because we, we had a conversation uh, a while back that that was a little related to this um, and and one of the things that we're going to do but haven't done yet is is attempt to crawl through the container registry that we have and see what we can get out of that. It's going to give us some of these things, but it's obviously not going to give us everything. And then, Sophie, I didn't know if you had any any other insights you might want to add here. No. <laughs> <laughs> but look, Google has this amazing new tool called. No, I, yeah, I just think, I'm just trying to think of other ways that like are, we can generalize this because I feel like we are getting really specific. Um, but it, it's hard to not get specific when things are not organized or architected in the same way. And of course, as we're talking about PyPy, I went back to the infrastructure comment because they had a major outage this week because of Fastly. Um, so PyPy's infrastructure was down. So yeah. is it like, Fastly now I'm getting everyone. ahead of myself. <laughs> Fastly broke everyone though. They're an un did. previously did. unknown risk to the whole, whole ecosystem. It, it broke the CI best practices badge. And yeah. you know what? I, 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 as soon as I discovered that, I went, there is no way I'm even going to try to deal with that. This is, this is going to break everybody. It bro it, it <laughs> broke my nobody, will, nobody will notice we're down because they'll notice 3,000 other sites before us. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to remember that, Twain, because we were talking about other ways where you, these kinds of things might be enumerated. Um, and it might involve going a level below. I mean, you're, you're talking about container registries um, versus just things mm -hmm. that are declared. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. But I, I don't want that to overstep the boundaries again between thinking about this as being a software focused metric versus infrastructure. Oh. Okay. And then maybe maybe that's an argument to not have the boundaries so clean. No, no, I, I think that's a really good observation. You know. All right, so I, I just added another thing that just, I, I don't know how to deal with it, but the, and there are many cases, you know, you, C Python is typically the implementation used in Python, but that's not true for all ecosystems. I, I present to you uh, the counter example, which is common lisp, uh, one of many common, uh, you know, common lisp has a whole bunch of implementations and the spec is so big that if it works on one, it typically works on any of them. So, you know, pick one, go. Which one's fastest that you would, that you want to use today? Mm -hmm. So it's you know, and I don't know how to solve that one either. But you know, I think for the most part, I think we're de we don't need to go further down this rabbit hole because yeah. I think most people are not going to ask to count that. They're going to stop above the runtime environment. Yeah. So, so I think we but, acknowledge it. We acknowledge the complications which we've done. Probably need to clean up the language, but I think we can. We can acknowledge okay. it and move on. Okay. I'm good with that. Depths.dev and depths.cloud, these are two different enterprises. 
There's no yeah. relation. Okay. No. Um, no. One, one's Google and one's not. Okay. Um, Sorry, which one? A, dev, stat, dev what? Depth.dev dev is the Google one, but there was depth.cloud, which we've previously discussed as well. Ah. Can um, we go back up to the dependency tree numbers? I'm just trying to understand how to read this section. Oh, that I'm yeah. highlighting the one direct dependencies, two, two is, transitive. Two, two plus is indirect. So it's like everything your direct dependencies depend on. And I guess the second one, number two would be, I have a dependency that's direct and it has these other dependencies that my main program doesn't have. And those would be the second order dependencies. And presumably you could have third, fourth, fifth order. I think you get over 90% of what you're needing to get from the first two orders. Yeah. Okay. I just, the way that it's written right now, I wasn't quite sure how to interpret it's, it. It's a little like, I hope you, you're good at algebra, right? You're good at abstract thinking and math, right? Well, cause this is abstract thinking. And if you, you know, if you're not really smart at math, maybe you won't get it. I don't know. So it does look, it's hard to understand. Um, I agree with you. I was trying to agree with you and be funny at the same time. I failed on one of those counts. No, I, I mean, I think it, I think it does make sense. I guess I'm trying to think of how the reader who's implementing this is going to interpret it. It's um, not super, super easy. And I think we could add some graphics that would make it super, super easy. Mm -hmm. Well, we have those visualizations in another doc. Okay. Um, yeah. But I think those visualizations maybe, yeah, maybe here it's just because we have the kinds of dependencies enumerated in the filters, but mm. maybe it sounds like it would be more appropriate to enumerate that under the dependency tree. So I guess it's providing some language yeah. to how to interpret the tree. Exactly. The tree. I think show the tree. I'm just making a comment because technically we're a minute over, but I oh. think we've done a good job of this metric is nearly ready to go. Um, does anyone want to take it to do to flesh it out? Uh, right now, I'm running away from yeah, to do. There are too many away, other things yeah. to do. Not as uh, Vinod. Yes, I can do it. Yeah, Vinod, I knew we'd do it. All right, so we'll put. Really, it's just. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll refine the language, and then maybe in oh, the next okay. meeting we just go review it, and yeah. it'll be okay. good to go. All right, um, I'm gonna give you an action. Oh, I, put just I did shoot a contact at the Open Source Insight team or a few questions around what's gonna be open sourced, if anything, in the API. So what's the best place to reply back if I hear back from them? Should I put that in the Slack or should I just respond back an email? Um, I'm in the Slack. I don't know, Arfan and Dwayne, are you in the Chaos I'm, Slack? I'm, I'm not in the Slack. That seems like a thing I should do. Um, do we, do we have Slack. a risk? Do we have a risk group in there? I can I make a risk. I can make a risk group. We don't. I can make a channel right now. The fact that they, okay. I'm going so I'll, the fact that they recognize that I'll put it there. The, I don't know when they're right. going to get back to me. That, that team's in Sydney, Australia. So who knows? Uh, <laughs> all right. And I'll invite you to the Slack in general, Dwayne. If you just, um, I should just use your Indeed address, or is there a different address you prefer? Indeed, uh, address. No yes. Okay. John, could you invite me as well? I, I, I will, Alyssa and Wheeler. You want in the Slack? You know you do. Yep, I do. Um, I do. I and I just I, put in the uh, in the chat for this discussion. Eventually, someday from the CI best practices so badge, love to link to these various sites with metrics about the projects. For sure. So uh, right now in that issue is a list of sort sites that present metrics data. If you know of one of a good one that's that is missing, let me know. You know, so I mean, there's uh, depths.dev, there's depths.cloud, there's LFX Insights, there's... So we have, so for for Chaos, we have a Augur site and a Grimoire Lab site that can introspect on our own projects. Okay. In case, though we also take requests to build up metrics for a project. We don't have the resources to build any of these metrics for every project on GitHub or GitLab, for example. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's really what I'm looking for. But um, Unless our wants to partner with us and have us do that with GitHub. Okay. Say again. Well, you know Sorry, what? I, I, <laughs> I was saying that we don't have a chaos metric site that looks at, for example, every project on GitHub, but we could partner with you, Arfan, to make that real. Sounds like a good idea. 
Yeah. I mean, okay. We could we could build metric sites for everything on GitHub with the help of GitHub to get the data. How, um, how's this? Um, I I've got to run off because I got to give a presentation. Yeah. But, and I'm, um, I'm why don't you just add? Over, so. a, why don't you add that comment uh, onto the issue? Hey, got you know, go to this site and whatever, and and, and, and what you just said. <laughs> okay. All right. I got to run. A pleasure, everybody. All right. Take and care. I think Thanks, Dave. Yeah, also got Our a phone. I'll drop thanks you an everybody. email. All right, you, thanks, everyone. Your speaker. I confirmed your speaker.